Hi, my name is Brett Linkletter, CEO and founder of Misfit Media, the best damn restaurant marketing agency on the planet. Here at Misfit, we help restaurant owners grow and scale their business through strategic online marketing practices. Right now, you're listening to our podcast, Restaurant Misfits, where we'll discuss all things related to restaurant marketing, management, and everything else in between growing a restaurant business. This podcast is also brought to you in collaboration with Total Food Service. For over 30 years, Total Food Service has provided the restaurant and food service industry with exclusive interviews to the latest news on products, trends, associations, and events. You can sign up for a free monthly subscription by visiting TotalFood.com today. And from all the misfits over here, we hope you enjoy the show. Cheers. In this episode, I interview a restaurant technology genius who's completely innovating the delivery game for restaurants today. His name is Alex Cantor, and he's the CEO of OrderMark, a tool that allows restaurants to use multiple third-party delivery apps, but receive orders on one tablet or printer, as well as manage one universal menu that can synchronize with every third-party marketplace. Alex was raised in the kitchen of the world-famous Cantor's Deli here in Los Angeles, where he and his team first invented OrderMark. He's a fourth-generation restaurateur, and the restaurant business has been in Alex's blood for over 85 years. He is a 2019 recipient of the Forbes 30 Under 30 and Fast Casual Executives Top 25. He's also started another virtual restaurant venture called Next Bite that works alongside with OrderMark. And as of most recently, OrderMark announced the close of its $120 million Series C funding round led by SoftBank. This guy is incredible, his team is incredible, and I can't wait for you to listen. So let's get into it. Alex Cantor, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Thanks for coming on the show. You, uh, you're an incredible person, man. You're doing so many cool things. Uh, you've helped so many damn restaurants. Uh, have such an amazing story overall. Can you just tell everyone, all of our listeners, a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into the space that you're in? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, just to set some context here. So I, I'm a fourth generation of Cantor's Deli, which is an old school, famous Jewish restaurant in Los Angeles that's been in my family for about 90 years. Um, and just like my dad and my grandfather, I grew up working in the family business and was really responsible for adapting it for the next generation, keeping it relevant, bringing in all the new technology. Um, and, and I really enjoyed... Um, proving to my family that technology was a great thing that we can we can embrace change even though we're an old school uh, you know family restaurant and um, I would run around to the restaurant conferences as a kid signing up for all this crazy new technology and um, was obsessed with with bringing in new initiatives and particularly reaching customers outside of our four walls I felt like there was so much opportunity with that and In 2008, when the recession hit, um, our foot traffic at the restaurant was down about 15%. We were forced to find new ways to reach customers outside of our four walls, Um, not just because it was fun, but because it was necessary. And we started experimenting with all the different delivery platforms and catering and um, frozen shipping and all this stuff and and really found a a ton of success through third-party marketplaces like Eat24 and Grubhub. Um, Eventually what became DoorDash, Postmates, Uber Eats, all these services. And we signed up for all of them. And each platform brought incremental revenue. We realized that if Cantor's as a brand wasn't listed on each of these services, we just simply didn't exist to the people who use them. And we, we found a lot of good success from it. 30% of our revenue shifted to this new delivery world. And wow. we, had, we had nine tablets, two laptops, and a fax machine just to manage all those incoming orders, um, which was a disaster for the restaurant from an operational perspective. Um, and it really felt like um, the online ordering companies hadn't spent enough time in restaurants to know how, how difficult that would be. You know, sending orders to a digital screen in the front of the restaurant is not even how restaurants operate. They, yep. they need orders printed yep. out in the kitchen and, and that whole thing. So we 
you know, we wanted to take a step back and reimagine the whole online ordering experience from scratch in a restaurant. And in 2017, um, a team of co-founders, we, we all got together and um, wanted to, to really make it easy for restaurants to be able to plug into all of these awesome revenue streams through a single device um, that can go directly in the kitchen, like an Epson thermal printer that would just print out standardized tickets, um, one dashboard that had you know, all of your reports, one menu that you can control for all of your online ordering business. And, and we got to work and started building the product in, in the family restaurant right behind the deli counter. Wow. Um, and spent a year just building the MDP and taking it out to work with other restaurants and, and eventually um, found a lot of um, immediate adoption with the problem that we were solving. There's not a lot of products and services and tools to help restaurants kind of a, a, adapt from you know, physical brick and mortar business to this new e-commerce phase of the restaurant industry that we're seeing. And, and we, yes. you know, we a lot of great timing with what we were doing and, and a lot of quick adoption. So that's, that's the founding story. Um, and just kind of my, my own personal background with, um, with the restaurant world. So cool. And Alex, I know even for us at our agency, Misfit Media, a lot of our clients know exactly what Ordermark is for, but for anyone who's not super familiar with Ordermark, can you just give us like the, the one, what is the, the major pain point that Ordermark helps solve for the restaurant space? Yeah, so we're basically, um, our, our core focus and mission as a, res- as, as a business is to help restaurants adapt to the changes in consumer behavior and giving them the, the products, services, tools, technology that they need to transform. And that means giving restaurants a single device that can go into their kitchen, like I mentioned, um, that that automatically will re- receive orders from all these different channels and reach customers where they're at, wherever whatever yep. channel they're using. And taking it one step further, we actually, um, you know, have always focused on how do we how do we get more orders into these kitchens. Um, and and yep. initially, you know, the way that we did that was by getting the each restaurant on as many platforms as they can be on. But we've now taken that even one step further with our new um, product offering that we launched called Next Bite, mm-hmm. which is basically a suite of virtual restaurant brands. These are menus that are designed specifically for delivery that only exist online. And we are able to layer these, these brands on top of um the existing restaurant's infrastructure on top of their existing business so that one restaurant can now fulfill online orders, not only for their own brand, but for an additional, you know, three or five brands out of their same kitchen using the same staff, the same overhead. And so we've really, um, as a, as a business, we've changed our strategy to focus on, on driving this incremental order volume into these underutilized kitchens. And right now in a post pandemic world, um, there's nothing more impactful we could be doing for our restaurants, driving those incremental orders into these kitchens. And so Next Bite has emerged as a, as a very exciting opportunity for restaurants to really supercharge their kitchen and, and be able to you know, handle an extra 10, 20, 30 orders a day without any incremental costs. That is so amazing. You guys are killing it, man. I love it. <laughs> this is so cool. No, but I think, I think the thing that's cool about you, Alex, is, is you know, I, in, in so many entrepreneurs I speak to, right, who, who are looking to start a business or grow a business or scale a business, they, they forget the, the one thing that you want to do in a business is solve a pain point for someone if you want to do something big. And the bigger the pain point you solve, the more money you can make and the more you can grow, I believe, right? You're solving major pain points here. You're helping restaurants move and adapt towards this new era of technology, which, as you know, in the restaurant space, so many restaurateurs are so resistant to it. Have you seen that, by the way, with a lot of restaurateurs? They're just, they're somewhat resistant. I mean, we see at our agency all the time, you know, our, our whole thing is we're trying to help restaurants move to, towards the digital marketing era. Hey, by the way, now with your marketing with the restaurant, you can actually track an ROI. I can see exactly what you spend and exactly what you make, just like e-commerce. But that's a totally foreign concept for most people, right? You know, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know, like we're in an old school industry. I mean, the the restaurant world. It's there's eight hundred thousand restaurants um, just in the U.S. um, and and sixty five percent of those are independents and mom and pops. They're not the large chains. 
And many of those mom and pop businesses don't have, you know, digital marketing teams or, or IT people. Um, they're really simple in, 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 in function where it's like treat customers well, make good food and people will keep coming back. Um, that's, that's been this old school mentality for the, for the restaurant industry for ages. And, um, yeah. but now there's so much, um, opportunity to, to take advantage of technology and to really go out and attract new business. And, and most, you know, of these smaller businesses don't have that young generation, um, kid coming into the business to update it and, and, and make all those, those, um, changes that have to happen. And so we, you know, we find a lot of, um, joy in, in, in being that for these restaurants where like the outsourced, um, you know, digital marketing arm or, or you know, um, like it, I, I like to think about like some of the, the locations that we work with and like we have this mom and pop restaurant in the suburbs of Indianapolis that, you know, it's, it's a one location pizza shop that wasn't doing very well post COVID. And we came in and introduced five incremental brands, five virtual restaurant concepts. One was like a grilled cheese brand. One was a chicken sandwich concept. And we, we basically train this operator to say, carry these ingredients from whoever your, your provider is, Cisco or US Foods. Um, every time an order prints out, make the food this way. And we turned on an extra 60, $70,000 a month in incremental gross sales in the first month that we turned these brands on for them. And oh for them, God. like they, they don't have the means to like launch all these menus and virtual brands. There's a huge learning curve to even know how to do that properly and, and optimize the promotions on these platforms. And, um, and they basically just put their heads down, make food and get paid for it. Um, and, and that's what they do best. So we, we really are trying to simplify this, create this turnkey process for restaurants to just light them up with more orders and, and, um, it's been really exciting to, to watch and, and to, to your point, like, you know, a lot of these old school businesses just don't even have the bandwidth to, to conceptualize doing something like that. Totally. It's, it's like, and it, it's almost like you're right. They don't have the bandwidth, but also they're also just resistant. You know, people, sometimes they, they don't like the change. And, and I think what you're doing though, is, is you're not just showing them that, Hey, this, this is the right thing, but you're, you're making massive impacts on their lives and their businesses, which is crazy. Um, I saw one of your brands is, is it's called Hotbox by Wiz. You're doing it. You're doing a, that is so cool. So you're doing, you're doing a concept with Wiz Khalifa. Yeah. Yeah. We built a, a really fun menu with, with the whole, uh, Taylor gang team and, and Wiz, you know, Wiz and, and his whole, um, t- team are just super business minded and, and they realized this opportunity to go out and help restaurants. And, and we, you know, we were thinking about, what sorts of items are performing really well on delivery and takeout? And there's there's this gap in the market for stoner food for for a whole menu yes. designed around you know munchies and and we <clears throat> we came up with this really fun brand um, called Hotbox by Wiz and it's basically you know everything from mac and cheese bites to hot wings um, and, <laughs> and stuff that you probably want to eat. Um, College you know, kids would love this. Yeah, it's actually doing really well on college campuses. Um, but but the beauty of, of this brand is that, um, you know, p- attaching a, a celebrity um, to the concept really helps on the promotional side. Um, not only is Wiz leveraging his reach and, and social influence to, to drive traffic to, to this virtual only restaurant chain that, that is now being fulfilled out of like, I want to say 30 or 35 different states across the country. Um, but yep. also when people open up their Uber Eats app or their DoorDash app, they're browsing and scrolling to see what they're going to order. And there's this really fun stoner concept with, you know, powered by Wiz Khalifa that is exciting and people love it and want to try it. And um, we have, you know, a lot of people who are now ordering it regularly, just like you would go to a restaurant regularly, especially as yeah. consumer behavior has changed. The way that people interact with the restaurants is now digital. And so it opens up this whole opportunity for these virtual only brands to exist and be successful. Um, but it still comes down to having amazing quality food, um, delivering a, a great experience that when the food arrives, it's, you know, it, it, it's still hot, it tastes good. And, and part of that comes down to, 
um, choosing the right menu, making sure that we're we're putting executable items on on these concepts that yeah. are actually going to hold up. You know, French fries, for example, um, are not an item that holds up well in delivery, so we avoided French fries on that menu. For example, got it. So, Alex, question for you because. A lot of our clients now since COVID, right, are, have adapted somewhat, right, or the best they can with us pushing a lot <laughs> for online, right? Online takeout delivery. <clears throat> a lot of them are frustrated with these third-party apps because of the high margins they're taking, right? 30, sometimes 40%. Um, do, you, do you see this just being the new norm? Do you see this getting fixed? What do you think about also third-party deliveries versus just direct online ordering? For the restaurant yeah so you know there was a lot of data that we were looking at that suggested that this huge digital shift was inevitably going to happen over the next 10 years and what happened with covid really just accelerated that 10-year shift to happen in a couple months instead and right um obviously right now when restaurants don't have any dining capacity you know, many businesses have shifted to all off-premise, which is not how the future state's going to look. There will be, you know, dining rooms and people going out for experiences, going out to a restaurant on a date or to celebrate or, or you know, to hang out with friends. Yeah. Um, but off-premise will be a, a, a large percentage of every business um, moving forward in this industry. And um, third party, the, here, the challenge for restaurants is that the third party ordering platforms have spent hundreds of millions of dollars to change consumer behavior so that when somebody's hungry, you know, they now open up the DoorDash app. Um, so if you're a restaurant that's trying to resist, you know, being on DoorDash and giving them their, their 20, 30% that they're, that they're taking, um, you just are not going to exist to all those people who are ordering on DoorDash. So you have to be on these channels, but also it's super important for you to have your own direct strategy as well. Many restaurants mm. have an ordering, um, a direct ordering button on their website or they have their own mobile app. It's a little bit unrealistic to expect that consumers are going to have every restaurant's app on their phone. Like think about how many restaurants you've ordered from. If you're a user of delivery, like you're not going to I, I agree, download man every mom and pop restaurants app and order from them directly. So because, because that's just not the reality of the situation, um, you know, as a restaurant, you have to have, you have to be, you have to have an omni-channel approach to this. You have to be where everyone is looking. And also you have to have a strategy to try to drive your own traffic through your own platform where you're not giving up those huge fees. Um, yeah. But keep in mind, you know, it's not just that you're giving DoorDash 30%. They're um, spending a ton of money on marketing and promotion. And most importantly, they're delivering the food for you. Um, to have your own driver costs a lot of money. Many restaurants have tried to experiment with hiring their own drivers or using third party drivers that aren't you know, from these apps and they're not as reliable um, uh, oftentimes. And, and because there's already an Uber driver on every block, um, the, the beauty of this is if you're a restaurant, you get 30 orders in five minutes for a lunch rush, Uber is going to send 30 drivers to come pick up your food and, and you'll still make sure that everyone's getting their food on time. Um, it's th these are amazing, powerful channels and services for restaurants to be able to reach um, audiences that are outside of those four walls. So it's really important to embrace them and to make those margins work. If, if you're a restaurant that um, has a, a very complicated menu and maybe certain items have higher food costs or take longer to make, um, you have to rethink your menu for delivery model. And sometimes that means removing certain items, um, increasing prices on your delivery menu. That's something that um, many of these platforms are now allowing for to make up that difference, which got it. At first, a lot of the online ordering companies wouldn't allow any of that. You had to match your price to your in-store menu, but now most of them are, are open-minded to allowing you to add you know, 10, 15, 20% to your delivery menu pricing to make up for that Got it. increase. So. Got it. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like you're, you're, you're pretty excited about both channels though. <clears throat> you got to be on these channels at third party, but also you should have your own. Um, for you guys at Ordermark, I mean, you, you guys mostly are partnering with these third-party apps, but also are, are, have you 
integrated with any specific online ordering platforms. Do you guys have your own system of that? Or is that something you guys are also excited about and pushing to your clients or, or no? Yeah. So, so order mark is not, um, an online ordering platform itself. It's not a consumer facing, uh, app or, or anything like that it's yeah order mark is, is basically aggregating all of the different channels that are out there so we partner with over 50 different online ordering services from the the, the big ones that most people know like grubhub postmates uber eats etc down to some of the much smaller localized or genre specific ordering services too yes but, and, but what i'm what i'm wondering too is if if you <clears throat> so you you partner with them but also any kind of direct ordering services that you also partner with or yeah okay, we, so, we, so we all the part, above. yeah yeah we partner okay. with all the white label ordering uh, channels as well that's the category that we describe as like <clears throat> the chow nows of the world so chow now mindful um fresh bites quarter there's all these companies that are basically um, the restaurants own ordering button on their website. Got it. And to us, that's just a, another partner integration channel for the restaurant. So Got um, it. That's th those types of companies we also are, are promoting and recommending to our restaurants that they Got should it. have at least one of them for their website. hundred percent. Okay. That's cool, man. Yeah. Cause the, the scenario that we always play in our minds, right. Is let's just say you're a restaurant and you're doing, I don't know, easy numbers, $10,000 a month in, in delivery sales. Okay. Right. And let's just say $10,000 in delivery sales is going specifically through Uber eats and you're giving away 30%. So you're giving away three grand a month to them. Right. Well, in another situation, let's just say you're doing 10,000 a month in delivery, but you had your own direct ordering service and you could spend, let's just say 1500 bucks on Facebook and Instagram ads to promote your business. Well, now you're keeping large majority of the margin and you're spending maybe half on the marketing that if you're doing it yourselves, do you, what, what is, about the driver cost though? <laughs> well, you can, well, like these, like these apps now have like, let's just say DoorDash drive, right? DoorDash drive. Yeah. You can get the driver for like, I think it's like five bucks or something. You can also offset that to the customer to pay for that too. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, so, so using a service like a DoorDash drive or last mile delivery API is usually in the seven to $8 range per order. Um, which you can choose to pass all of that onto the customer, but you're not going to get nearly as many orders if you do that. Um, the sweet spot range, ideally, if you can offer free delivery, that's the best. But even if you're at two, three, four dollar delivery, and the restaurant's eating half of that, that that would very well make up that remaining fifteen percent that you're that you're saying might be beneficial. And yeah. the hardest part about it is that you would have to generate the same amount of volume on your own platform that you would on DoorDash which means driving a lot. Um, you have to be very efficient in your Facebook spend to, to get that kind of conversion. Yeah, that you got to be most, damn good. Most, rest, most re mom and pop restaurants don't even have that, the ability to, to, to think about how they would, um, you know, how, like be able to convert that. Obviously, there are a lot of great companies out there and resources that will help them. But we've seen a lot of mom and pop restaurants try to, try to, um, resist the third-party marketplaces and just say order from our own channel and more often than not it's unsuccessful got it you're just saying because there's so many pieces of this puzzle for this thing to work and so hey if you can make it work more power to you but just the, the chances that they are going to figure it out on their own is pretty slim essentially it's it's well it it's, it's a volume game too you have to be driving enough volume that you can sustain a, a, a delivery only format and um yeah you know, most of these restaurants right now, they have a lot of fixed costs. The rent is fixed, whether their dining room's open or not. And so if, if you are still paying $10,000, $15,000 a month for rent, you need to hit a certain amount of orders just to even break even um, on, the, on that. And so just by being on all these platforms, even if you're not making as much per order, you still need that volume to sustain your delivery. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy times we're going through, isn't it? Um, like you said, I mean, we, we saw the same thing. I mean, our, our business model, our, our catchphrase just before COVID was, hey, we turned web traffic into foot traffic, <laughs> right? Then COVID hit. So, you know, things had to change. We had to adapt. And so now, you know, we are pushing a lot of online ordering for our clients. But um, I agree with you, man. I mean, I'll be honest. A lot of these platforms, you know, you said that the chow nows of the world, they're, 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 they're pretty, 
weak in the technology they offer, in, in my opinion. I mean, like you said, the Uber Eats and the DoorDashes, they've invested millions and millions of dollars into this stuff. They've, they've figured out the right kind of flow to get that customer to convert at the highest range. They, they, they've done it. Some of these you know, direct ordering services that I see a lot of our clients sign up for, I mean, I hate to say names, but it's just, ah, it's, it just, it's ugly. It's not clean. It, there's bugs here and there. You can't even make an order once in a while. Um, it's well, hard. It's hard to support it. Yeah. You know? I, I, I mean, like just to give you some perspective at, at one point, I think back in 2016, I want to say maybe 20, end of 2015, um, yeah. Cantor was, Canners is a, a very high volume takeout and delivery business. It's one of the top performing delivery locations in all of LA, um, according to a lot of the online ordering platforms. But at one point we were on 14 different services. Um, wow. 13 of those were third party marketplaces like the DoorDashes of the world. And we also had Chow Now, which was powering our, our direct ordering on our website. And yep. if you look at our entire off-premise business, which was a couple million dollars a year, um, just on these platforms, only 4% of that volume was happening through Chow Now. 96% was on Uber Eats, Postmates. Wow. It just shows like how, you know, it, it is, you should absolutely consider your own channel and, and platform. And, and Canners didn't have a big digital marketing spend. We weren't trying to, you know, push a bunch of order volume through the platform through like a, a budget format. So, you know, wow. naturally if we, I'm sure if we had some sort of marketing spend, maybe we would be able to shift that from 4% to you know, on a good day, 10 or 15% if we're, if we're, if we're really investing in it, but it's still such a small percentage compared to the volume that we were getting on Postmates and all these other services. That's insane. And then, you know, to push that a, a step further, you know, you mentioned that you made a great point of apps, right? So many restaurants, they want their own apps today. And, and for what reason? Nobody wants to download a restaurant app. I mean, that's incredibly annoying. I, I personally hate it. Um, yeah. I, I think the apps are really more for the super super fan customers, the, the really loyal ones who are probably going to use it frequently and maybe order once a week or once a month. Yeah. And those are really, that's a really important segment of your customer base because um, there's a lot of data that shows that customer lifetime value um, of, of your restaurant customers is really interesting. Like um, I've seen upwards of 60 to 70% of people who place an order from a restaurant will never order from that restaurant again. Um, wow. About 20 to 30% will order, you know, kind of frequently, but not often. And then there's like this four to 5% range of like your super users that drive a lot of order value over their lifetime. If they're ordering from you, like if a regular customer is ordering once or twice a week for several years, that's that's a very loyal person who, you know, maybe maybe they'll have your app and maybe it'll make it easier for them to like yeah. click reorder and all that stuff. And and that's a lot of money saved over time if that person was going to regularly order from you on Uber Eats, for example. Hundred percent. It just, there was a, a conference we went to before COVID hit and we, we all used to do conferences, you know, <laughs> in the good old days, <laughs> but um, we were at this conference and um, there were, I'm not going to name which restaurant names are really, really big brands uh, speaking so highly about their, their native apps that they had built and all the users they had gotten on their apps. And so I raised my hand and asked a question at the end of their session. I said, Hey, by the way, what percent of your sales are coming through this app? And the whole room went silent. And then they laughed and did still didn't answer. And I said, well, what's the answer? I said, 1%. <laughs> and so exactly. I just, oh, even for these, these massive brands, I mean, 500,000 plus locations, 1%. So it, it's just, it's brutal. And when I, when I heard that, that's, that was the nail in the coffin for me. I was like, you have all these, a lot of mom and pop restaurants I speak to, you know, you know, one, two, maybe three locations, they're pushing their own apps. And oftentimes, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say it's the, it's the wrong idea every time. I mean, sometimes it can be great, like you mentioned, but oh God, the, the kind of times that the amount of stress levels I've seen it, it, it produced for some of these people and the amount of volume they're able to create from it doesn't make sense. Um, so you guys just raised uh, a series C I saw you guys raised $120 million, right? Yeah, yeah, we um, we we had a, a really just 
emotional roller coaster year last year with like the devastation of the industry and thinking that, you know, upwards of 25 to even 40 or 50 percent of restaurants were probably going to go out of business because of this whole situation. It was like this moment wow. of like heartbreak for our industry. And yep. then to 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 see what happened um, from an impact perspective, the way that our products and services helped a lot of these restaurants like be like be the difference of keeping their doors open or not. Um, I think that really um, showed that like this was our moment to come in and really help thousands of restaurants sustain a delivery model and, and give them the the capabilities to really survive and get through this. And and that that really was a big inflection point for us as a company and, and attracted a ton of um, you know big investor attention and, and to bring SoftBank to the table was um, just such a, a amazing experience for us as a, as a business to 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 bring on like not only the world's largest investment fund but some a group that really has gone so deep into our industry, um, yep. being large shareholders in Uber and DoorDash and Reef and and all these companies that are that are really changing the whole game of the restaurant world to to to, to really have that perspective and to be able to go out and make a really big impact on a much bigger scale of what we're doing um, is, is very, very exciting. We're very grateful for it. And it's, it's allowed us to already just in the last couple of months, we've, we've doubled up our team um, from, from a employee headcount standpoint. And how big is the team now? I think we're at uh, 160 or 170. Uh, I can't keep track these days. <laughs> 160 or 170. Wow. Amazing, man. That is so cool. So, wow, $120 million. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are thinking, what the hell is he going to do with $120 million? Uh, <laughs> um, so what, what, are, what, what are your plans? I mean, what, what is the vision of Ordermark? What is the vision of Next Byte? You know, where, where do you see this all going? Because I completely agree with you as far as, hey, the, the, the modernization of restaurants means turning to tech, right? Becomes, means, you know, expanding your business outside your fall, four walls. But $120 million, where, 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 is, where is this going? What are your plans? What do you see coming next? Uh, what's that look like for you? Yeah, um, so we, you know, we are continuing to double down on building product offerings that are helping drive incremental restaurants into, sorry, incremental orders into these restaurants that we're working with. We look at all of the restaurants in the U.S. as, um, you know, we, we believe that over 90% of restaurants have underutilized kitchens and have yep. extra capacity to handle more orders. And that is where we are focused is how do we drive more orders into these underutilized kitchens and empower these restaurants to do more with their same overhead, with their same um, labor, with, with everything that they're already paying for. And there are all of these new kind of ghost kitchen companies that are building new delivery only kitchen spaces and um, commissary kitchens. And um, we don't understand why there's so much, so much of that happening because there's, there's already so much underutilized capacity in these kitchens that we're, we're laser focused on helping these restaurants just maximize that. And so we're, we're, what we're doing the next is we're really, we're really turning every restaurant into a ghost kitchen. Um, we're enabling a, a, a location to, to run five different virtual brands out of a single unit. And we're finding a lot of success with that. And we, we want to do that on a much bigger scale. And, and we believe that the next, um, the next McDonald's, the next Domino's Pizza could very well be a virtual restaurant chain that only exists online. Um, that is being run out of the back of existing restaurants. And, and that's, I completely agree. That's what we're so, building. <laughs> so, so, so this, so this is mostly, so it's, it sounds like order mark got you on the map and next bite is, is basically world domination. Is that kind of what's looking like for um, you? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. we still have, <laughs> we, we, we still realize that there are many restaurants that need aggregation technology. That's like a, it's like step one. It's an obvious thing to us. But yeah. The way that we design this technology is so much more powerful than just aggregating the orders. It's also enabling 
um, multiple brands, multiple menus to, to come in one device to, to be managed from a single dashboard. And it's, it's the underlying infrastructure that allows us to go out and really turn on this incremental volume. So 100%. You know, one doesn't work without the other. Um, and and we, we believe that order mark is really um, what's enabling us to go out and, and make this kind of impact with next bite. So it's, it's, it's kind of a one, two punch. And, you know, there's still many restaurants that are just signing up for, for um, order marks aggregation service. And we're continuing to ramp up that side of the business as well. Got it. I love it, man. This is really cool. Um, so it, it sounds like, and it, it, you know, it's, this is, man, I think this is like my 28th episode now. We're in our, the end of our second season of this podcast. And a lot of people have been really excited about this whole like cloud kitchens type concepts or either the commissary kitchens and this and that. But it sounds like for yourself, you're saying, hey, you know, there's not a whole lot of need for that. There's already all these kitchens underutilized. Um, do you think people pursuing that is, is the wrong idea? Or do you think there's still a place for it? I mean, yeah, there, there is, you know, there, there I've always said that kitchens are going to get bigger and dining rooms are going to get smaller over time. And yeah. the, the emergence of these like ghost kitchen facilities is basically an evolution of that, that theory that if you're an, if you're a new business that is going to be starting out, you know, in 2022, and you're thinking about, you know, launching a, a Cuban sandwich shop, um, one, one option is to go open a physical brick and mortar restaurant and have, you know, seating capacity and higher rent. But another option would be to just optimize a delivery only version of a menu where there's no front of house, there's no dine in, there's no dishes to wash. And, and you want to really just specialize in this off premise delivery capacity. Um, you know, these facilities are a great option for you, but you still need to have a significant amount of volume to break even in, in these businesses. Cause you would 100%. think that if you're chopping, chopping up a bunch of, um, you know, real estate into these small kitchens that the rent would be significantly lower, but um, even in these cloud kitchen facilities and kitchen United, the rent is not um, as cheap as you'd think. Um, yeah. So in order to break even, you still need to be doing over half a million dollars a year in gross sales and a delivery only format which for a new brand, it's very difficult to make that work. Um, I, I think mean, they're the most, go ahead. You go ahead. I was gonna say it, it, that's, that sounds really damn difficult for somebody who's, who's looking to start, just get going on that. I mean, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think, I think um, the most successful brands um, in, in the ghost kitchen world are actually not mom and pops or newer brands. It's, it's, the Chick-fil-A's of the world, the Wendy's, the, 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 the brands that already have this huge um, recognition and the people ordering on these platforms have no idea that it's coming out of a ghost kitchen facility. Um, yeah. They just see, you know, Chick-fil-A pop up on Uber Eats, they order and it's just being made in this, this separate site and kitchen. Um, totally. So it's, you know, those types of brands are very powerful that, that, you know, they're already going to come in and do over a million a year in annualized sales, if not even more than that. But um, I, I don't think that that model works for most restaurants, especially today. Um, and I think that you need to have um, or what's more interesting to me is um, and, and I, I, I can tell you from experience, we put a Canner's Deli in Cloud Kitchens, in Kitchen United, in Colony Kitchens some of the earlier ghost kitchen facilities in the LA area. And even, even a brand as powerful as Cantor's that has, you know, very good delivery volume. It was still hard to break even. Um, but, wow. but, but, but looking at underutilized kitchens that already have fixed costs, there's no incremental labor or rent. So just layering on top of your existing business, virtual brands, that's the model to me that that's the most exciting because each incremental order is profitable there is no break even when you're taking an existing business and layering on top of that the existing brands and that's that's why i think our our model with next bite is really successful is because we're going into these restaurants and turning on virtual brands without adding any additional cost besides the food cost which yeah making well over that so 
this no i think you're you're totally on the right track man i mean it, it sounds like it just makes way more sense i mean we have man i don't know the exact number but probably close to two dozen brands we work with right now that have turned on some virtual concepts already and so we're, we're yeah. also in the stage of, of adapting to this with our model because the way our, our, our price point model works is, you know, we, we charge per location we work with. And so we've had to adapt our price point as a marketing agency for restaurants because we're like, okay, so it's under this location, but now we have three different brands there. How, how, do, we, how do we adapt our marketing strategy for that? And so it's, it's been interesting. And I've been seeing it more and more and more. It seems like honestly, every week now we got a client asking, hey, by the way, I just added this chicken fingers concept. Like, all right, where's the location? No, no, no. It's within, It's already in my kitchen. So yeah, it's there, it's moving a, quick. There's a lot of there's a lot of people catching on to, to the idea that they could be doing this, and there's a lot of experimentation happening. And overall, these platforms that um, the the third party marketplaces will get very very crowded very fast um, because everyone's trying different things out. But ultimately, it still is going to come down to branding and marketing and yep. digital real estate and and having great reviews. I mean, you think about um, the way that people make decisions of where they're going to go out to eat. Sometimes they look at Yelp and they see, you know, what has the most ratings, what has the, the, you know, the best reviews. They look at lists of like, what are the best, you know, places to dine out in my city. And, and if, if you're just spinning up menus and putting them online, that is a very short-sighted mentality um, to, to driving incremental orders. You really have to be thinking about building um, big brand recognition and, and, and digital marketing strategies and everything that you have to think about for a regular restaurant applies to the virtual restaurant. hundred percent, man. No, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, literally like, you know, a struggle for us as an agency, as a marketing agency for restaurants, is a lot of people, like you said before, early in this conversation, you said, you know, so many restaurateurs just think, oh, great food and service is, is going to get you there. Yeah, we got word of mouth, but that's a slow way to grow your business. Hey, word of mouth is great, but if we can accelerate that more, get more people to know about you, talk about you and, and try you on a daily basis, well, you can scale the business quicker. And I think to your point also, people forget all the time that, hey, uh, you, you, you got to have that brand recognition. Yeah, you, your, your food has to look good in the pictures too now. <laughs> you know, uh, don't forget that. I mean, that's honestly for us, man, is 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 a huge pain point is we'll work with a client and... Uh, you know, they'll send us all their, all their food photos that we're going to promote then on, on their channels and whatnot. And it's just the kind of stuff they're giving us. They forget, you know, that, Hey, this is your product. It has to look good. If you're shopping it's for not, Nikes it's online. Not they, it's not even that they forget. They just have no idea. There's such a learning curve to get this right. Totally. hundred percent. Um, so this is, this is, again, this is the trend we're going down. This, this is not a, a guessing game anymore. I think it's pretty damn obvious to most of the world that, hey, restaurants are going more tech. We're moving more towards this e-commerce model. Um, what else is kind of new and surprising that it, that's coming up in this space that you think most people just aren't really talking about yet? Or maybe something you guys have noticed that you've, been, that you've seen that other people aren't thinking about quite yet? Um, you know, I think... Um, I think a lot of people have this like misconception that things are going to return to normal. <laughs> and I think that's a really dangerous mentality right now. Um, right. I think that there, there's a new reality that we live in where business travel is forever changed. Catering may never return to what it was before. Um, there's just fundamental changes to, to the way that consumers are interacting with restaurants and you have to, you have to be thinking about ways to adapt your business and make make the the hard decisions to go to go get the business and, and go make it work rather than just waiting around and hoping that things are going to return to normal. And, I, and I've seen way too many restaurants say, "We're just going to wait this out, and and you know, in a year from now, things will be fine <laughs> and and return." But it's it's. Um, the, the ordering demographic that used to be 18 to 34 year olds has now drastically expanded um, to you know families to older generations. My my grandfather is now a power user of DoorDash. He's got the, the Dash Pass um, because he can't go anywhere, <laughs> and you know he is obsessed with with this with this way of ordering from his favorite restaurants. Now he's not 
um, ever going to stop using this app now that he's discovered it and learned how to use it and has his credit card information stored and all of his favorite restaurants are <laughs> easy to reorder from. Um, and so because this, this has changed, like even when dining rooms open up again, um, it's not just going to be this magic, like, let's go back to the way that things were before. It's, um, it's undoubtedly just a different restaurant industry that we live in. And, and you have to, you have to go out and experiment and, and be ambitious and make the changes that have to happen to adapt the business for this new reality that we live in. And you can't just sit around and wait for it. So that's, um, I don't know if that directly answered your question, but I, I just, I, I don't think it's being talked about enough. And I think there's still too many restaurants that are sitting around waiting for things to get better. I think you are hundred percent right. And I completely agree, man. I mean, <clears throat> All the time I hear people saying, you know, what, when we open up again, we'll, we'll start working with you guys. When, when this happens, if we can just get there, then, then we'll do this. But you're right. You know, uh, this thing could be a lot longer than we're hoping it is. And, and like you said before, it may never go back to the way it was. Who, who knows? But yeah. resisting these I mean, technologies. Office culture will never, like the idea of having like massive headquarters for, for businesses, it's just like not a thing anymore. And that will very, very much impact lunch rush. I mean, a lot of the business that restaurants get for lunch is, you know, people taking a break at work and, and going and grab, going to grab lunch. And, and I think as more and more people work from home, that that's going to now shift to eating more at home, which, which could mean through delivery or it could mean cooking more, but um I, I, there are so many restaurants that are that make most of their money during those those peak r rush hours, and if if yeah. those are forever going to change, they have to start thinking differently. Yeah, God, it just seems like we're we're moving towards a world where everything's on demand, everything's digitized, and everyone just is at home by themselves. <laughs> how how obviously you know you mentioned that this has been a, a, this last year has been a, a emotional roller coaster for you guys. You went up and down and and then obviously you got that amazing funding from SoftBank, which is fantastic. Um, how have you been handling this this whole pandemic? I mean, has it been stressful for you? Have you been getting through it? Are you are you thriving on through it? What's been your mental space during this whole time? Yeah, I mean, like when it first hit and we, we had to like move to this remote world. I was so eager to get back to the office and there's so many parts of the culture that, um, you know, grabbing everyone for the Monday morning stand up and um, just, it's hard to manage remotely in general. It's, it's, it's just a it weird feeling I'm like even, you know, just being able to recognize when um, certain people in the company are, um, not having a great day or like, you know, like not being able to go up to them and say, Hey, let's go on a walk and, and like, you know, talk about what's going on. It's, it's hard to pick up on those same social cues. So that part I think has been the hardest for me um, just to make sure that everyone is like in good spirits, but overall yep. people have been handling it really well. And then just on a personal level, like I'm such a foodie. I love dining out at restaurants. I love going out and you know, experiencing travel and, and I miss all the conferences that we go to. And, um, you know, I, I'm excited for some of that to return, but also I, I've learned how to make this environment work. And I've, I've found myself very productive um, when there's not a ton of distractions happening around me too. So, um, you know, learning, yeah. learning to, to, to make it work and, and making improvements to the, to the work from home office situation to, to be able to, you know, um, start my day a little earlier and my day a little later. Like, I feel like I've been able to put in more hours without having to drive to work, stuff like that. So it's, it's been good. Got it. Nice, man. That's, that's really cool. And, and I have to agree with you. I mean, it, it is, it is tough to do the, the same morning standups for us too, right? Hey, how, how do you, how do you, it's, it's hard to pick up on those social cues over a zoom call, right? You know, not seeing everyone, you, you don't have, the, the, the pass bys you might have during lunch, you don't have the small talks around the corner, whatever the case during work things you're doing. Right. So it, it's, it's different. It's in, we had, we had to adapt. Um, Alex, your background specifically, are you, uh, are you a tech guy? How did you get into this whole software world in general? Did you build the initial product with a small team or what's your background? Yeah, I, I um, I've always been interested and passionate about, um, 
entrepreneurship and it's, it's what I studied in college. I studied economics and entrepreneurship, but I, I had started a couple of businesses in college. I'd always been interested in, in restaurant tech in general, but I'm not an engineer. I don't build code. Um, part of the co-founding yep. team brought on uh, very early on three engineers that helped build the first version of the product and obviously evolved a lot um, since then, but it's, I've always been more on the, um, the, the, restaurant operation side of things, thinking about, um, you know, how to, how to market and, and sell into restaurants. And, and cause I've been on the other end of it for so long. I was the one being sold to, um, yes. by so many different restaurant companies that I just, I feel like I, I had a very, um, deep understanding of what works and what doesn't work. And yep. when, when you can go into a restaurant and offer something that, that, that has a direct ROI that you can show, um, very quickly, I think it's it's a very uh, promising way to to you know to be able to to go out and 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 turn it on in a lot of locations. And I think from from day one, that's been something that we've been very good at as business. And um, and it's you know it's we offer month to month contracts with restaurants. There's no long term commitments, and many restaurants love. Um, you know, trying it and then they very quickly see that it's, it's making a big impact for them. And, and I think that's been a, a big key to our success. hundred percent, man. God, it's so cool. I, I, again, I, I love what you guys are doing. And, and again, I, I think the best part of what you're doing is, is you're, you're, you're really, really riding this trend of technology moving up. And obviously I know you said, even the beginning of the conversation, you know, it, you felt proud that you, you could bring your family Cantor's deli into this tech world. Right. Um, what was your big motivation for that? I mean, what was your interest? Just thinking this could be better? Was that the main factor? Um, you, I, I had talked to a lot of restaurants in my network to say, you know, how are you solving this, this crazy challenge? Because the staff in our restaurant hated me for bringing in all this hardware and training yeah. and um, making their lives so much more difficult with all this, this other stuff to manage on top of what they were already doing. Yeah. And it just felt like a, a natural evolution that had to happen. And, and you know, I, I think the, the founding team felt like we all really understood that this was something that we had a unique um, opportunity to go out and solve an unfair advantage to be able to build this in a, in a real restaurant, high volume environment and, and test and iterate. And, um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we were, it, it's when you start a business, I, I feel like you have to have so much passion for the problem that you're solving because yep. if you don't inevitably you're going to hit these like really hard things that come up and and if, if you're not like super uh, passionate about it you're gonna get burnt out very quickly i found myself um, experiencing that with several other companies that i've tried to start in the past is like do i really care about this mission and making it happen and like i, I think the answer was no um, but then with order markets, like this is, um, it's, I find so much excitement and joy in what we're doing every day that it's like impossible to get burnt out. Yeah, I agree, man. I mean, you hear people get this burnout all the time and they say it's natural and it happens to everyone. But I think if you're truly passionate about what you do, I don't think so. I don't think you should get burnout. I think, you know, you, you should be excited about what you do. Um, Alex, just you know, last question for you is, is uh, as you've evolved as an entrepreneur, you said you've had a few different businesses before this. Now you guys have had a ton of success. Um, you're, you're, you're evolving the business. You're, you're expanding to new services. You're, you're doing all these things. What have you learned about yourself throughout this whole process? What's been kind of, I don't know, some kind of crazy aha moment for you. How have you developed as a person through this as a CEO? Um, you know, I, I've, I think some of the biggest learnings that I've had is that um, really caring about the the culture and the employee experience makes it so much easier to go out and sar solve hard problems like in the yep. in the business world. Um, if everyone's having a, an enjoyable, you know, growing experience working for a company, it's a lot easier to go out and, and find success and and really make a, a a big impact. And and I think you know, it starts with um, what's happening internally and, and making sure that we're defending the culture from, from 
you know, becoming something that's, that could, that could ruin what's happening. So it's, you know, it's, it's really focusing on, on people first and, and making sure that we're all in, enjoying what we're building and, and that we're having, you know, celebrating wins along the way and, and really prioritizing company values and living them, breathing them, uh, making decisions against them and, and just committing and, and saying, this is, this is what we're doing. And that is such an important infrastructure component to, to be able to build on top of. Um, so that, that's been a big um, educational experience for me. 100%. And that's been honestly a theme of, of a lot of the podcasts I've done here is, is that you, you, you got to put your team number one, right? You, you, need, your, you need your people that are committed, that are focused, that are excited, that are having fun every single day. Um, big thing I tell my team all the time is just, just have fun, right? People want to have fun. People want to enjoy what they do. And, and uh, obviously people love working at a growing company. Um, um, Alex, just one more question for you. What do you, what do you do to, to stay energized? You, you, uh, I mean, you obviously, you said you've been putting in extra hours, anything you do specifically, do you, do you work out? Do you drink a lot of coffee? What's, what's kind of your, your morning routine to get going? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm right for the day. Morning. I have a, I don't have a very good morning routine. <laughs> Sometimes I wake up and jump right into a uh, slack and everything, but um, I think just making sure that I um, sprinkle in um, time to, to have dinner with friends and, and um, take some time on the weekends, I think is, is super important. I, I have a Peloton that I, I try to use more than, <laughs> I, than I, I'm currently doing now. I love it. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I try to actually. The, the, I would say the most important thing that I have is um, is a CEO coach that I work with regularly. Nice. Um, who really is more like um, a meditation, mindfulness um, guru, if you will. And, and oh, is, there you like, go. I was going to ask you to meditate, but I wasn't yeah, sure. Yeah, he's, he's he's really changed um, a a lot of um, a lot for me. Um, he's. He's helped give me like all of the mental tricks and tools that I need to like overcome really, um, really challenging experiences and see everything as a growth opportunity and just having a growth mindset and everything that I do is, is super valuable for, for the sustainability. Like it, it allows you to sprint a marathon. <laughs> I love that, man. No, I, I'm huge on meditation. I've talked about this in some other podcast episodes, but I meditate almost daily I have a journal I write in every single day. And, uh, you know, I, th I think as a CEO, you know, we, we face a lot of stresses and especially as you grow a business, right? Things break in the process all the time in it and having the right mind space, the right, the right growth mindset to approach these things, to make these hard decisions is so incredibly important. Um, well, Alex, thank you so much for today, man. That was absolutely amazing. Um, you know, so many great points you brought up. Uh, congrats again to so much of you guys' success you guys are seeing. And uh, I'm gonna be looking out for the Hotbox by Wiz for sure, man. I'm gonna have to check this out. <laughs> it sounds delicious. Thank you. Yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're just getting started. It feels like we just kind of unlocked our growth potential, and and as as much as we've been scaling, it feels like there's this there's this real startup energy in everything that we're doing, and and a hustle, and and it's it's been a lot of fun. So thank you again for having me. Um, it's gonna be very interesting next couple of years to see how how fast our industry is changing and um hundred percent man about everything you guys are doing as well and so alex just last thing if, if anyone's listening to this any restaurant tour and they're thinking to themselves wow i want to work with alex and order mark or next bite or whatever the case how do how do they find you how do they do so yeah just go to ordermark.com um find us on any of the social channels and we'll you know we'll get someone on on a call with you so sounds perfect man um, again, Alex, thank you for your time today and uh, we'll be in touch real soon. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks.